was diagnosed with breast cancer at, in 2004 at the age of 34. She had two children aged one and three. And Eva came up with the idea of creating a magazine dedicated to breast cancer. She established it in 2006. It's called Mamma Mia. It has a circulation of 20,000 people. And the magazine includes various special editions on metastatic and hereditary breast cancer, breast cancer reconstruction. And it publishes a quarterly magazine solely devoted to ovarian cancer. In 2008, the, the publication was awarded the Breast Cancer Communication Award of the German Cancer Society. Prior to founding the, and working for Mamma Mia, Eva worked for the Israeli government tourist office in Berlin as a spokesperson for 12 years. So we're going to ask Eva to tell us about her experience, to tell us about things that nurses did that really made a difference, but also to tell us things that could have been done better or that she wished nurses knew at the time. So Eva, over to you. Thank you very much for this kind introduction and um, good evening everybody. I, it's a real pleasure to be here and to have this talk and to talk a bit about my experience. So um, as you heard my breast cancer story or history unfortunately is quite long. Um, it started in 2004. However it became different and serious. It was serious before. But in 2018, I found out that um, cancer had spread to other parts of my body. So um, I'm a metastatic breast cancer patient since um, three years. Um, and I have to say with three years, I already reached the average survival years of metastatic breast cancer. Um, so I now realize that living with metastatic breast cancer is a totally different um, different challenge than having early breast cancer and of course as a mother with two little children um, almost babies I was I was terrified that I couldn't see them growing up and um, when my breast was taken off at the age of 34 and my hormones were you know pushed down so it was it was a tough time but nothing compared to living with metastatic disease this is like a roller coaster that um, that you sit in suddenly, although you didn't book this trip, you sit in a roller coaster, you go up and down. It's like um, bad diagnosis, new treatment, restaging, and maybe um, another progression and the same. So it's it's kind kind of up and down. Um, there's no exit, there's no way out, and there's no happy ending to this story and this uh, roller coaster ride. So. Um, I think this is a very special um, situation and challenge, every day's challenge. And um, I don't really agree. I wouldn't call metastatic breast cancer a chronic disease. I wish it was. But when I think of chronic diseases, I think of um, diabetes or um, something like that, that you can have treatment and you have a normal life expectancy. So with the average survival time of three years and a bit more in some other two more types, um, maybe five, six years. For me, it's not a chronic disease because, um, I mean, we're still dying in the middle of our life. So that's too early. Um, so I want uh, research to continue working hard as they did in the past. I want them to continue so we can really make it a chronic disease with a normal life expectancy also for young women. So what have I learned throughout these years? Um, Communication is one of the of the major things that that make your life easier as a patient, and communication means with everybody, with your family, with your friends, with your children, with your everybody, and of course with your doctors, with your nurses, um, and communicating with the medical team is always a bit challenging, um, only because of time. 
I think it's only because of time, because everybody in the hospital is in a rush and we have so many questions and we we wish to have so much time with all the healthcare providers. And um, I know it's not possible. And I know that patients often compare, uh, complain because the HCPs don't have enough time and not all answers were, uh, not all questions were answered. Um, but I think we always have to see both sides. So I think it's important to have trainings for both sides. We also have to educate patients on how to communicate, how to come to the point, how to note questions uh, you have in advance to be focused and how to make notes. Um, so you still remember what, what you spoke about when you leave the office, especially now in COVID times that in many countries patients are not allowed to come with someone to the medical talks and maybe diagnosis talks. That's that's really tough. But starting from the diagnosis talk, so um, I believe that there is a major role for nurses to attend these meetings. I mean, it's of course the first breast cancer diagnosis and then even more the diagnosis of metastatic disease. Um, then every recurrence, every, you know, progression needs some special attention. And I wish there was always a nurse present when the doctor is like giving the news, the bad news to patients. I wish there was a nurse sitting next to the patient, getting the information as well. And then when leaving the room, having time to sit with the patient and explain again, and maybe also later at the phone or another day, but just someone who attended the talk, who really understood what the doctor said, and then to like go through it again and again and again, because the questions don't come at once. They come after a while and they come in the evening and they come in the night. So if there was one nurse that that um, was there and I knew she understood everything. And I can always ask her because maybe I don't want to bother my doctor. Maybe he doesn't have time, but there's this nurse. And I, nurse, I know nurses are much more, um, um, they have much more time, but the word I'm looking for is uh, patient. They're much more patient and, um, and kind of, uh, of nice and heartly and, you know, this is something I feel much more comfortable when I really talk about my deepest fears and side effects and everything with a nurse because I know um, they understand. They, they are, in my eyes, most of the nurses are much closer to patients than the doctors are. It's a different relationship and maybe doctors should be a bit more, you know, um, distant and, you know, I won't call it professional because nurses are very professional, but a, a bit more distant. Um, and maybe um, a nurse can be more empathic and a, a bit, you know, can maybe also hug you or something. So this is something that I'm, I, I think is very valuable to, to have this nurse that is there for me and for my, you know, problems. And talking about adverse events, I also found that um, nurses have a lot of experience with adverse events and they know little trick here and little things here because they talk to patients and patients have ideas and they have experience. So I think nurses are much more experienced with the management of, of adverse events than many doctors, maybe most doctors. So I really appreciate the time I can spend with my nurse talking about adverse events and they know the, li the little things and not only the treatment things like you take loperamid and you take this and that, um, but also the, the things what you shouldn't eat and how to take care about your skin and and those things and what you can do for your well-being. It's so important um, to have the nurses who have experience and who listen during the chemo sessions and whatever, listen and talk to patients, hear so many stories. I think that's that's so important for us and I really, really appreciate it. And, you know, when I got my diagnosis of uh, metastasis, I, I remember if it, as if it was today and I think most patients remember as if it was today. You never forget this moment. But um, it, I know a lot because of my work, 
So when I saw the pictures of my um, body scan, of the CT scan on the screen, I said to the, to the radiologist, but those are not my pictures. He looked at me, he said, those are your pictures. And I knew what it meant. And I was like frozen and he was frozen and everybody in the room was frozen because I was in shock and they saw that I'm in shock. So nobody knew what to do until this nurse said, excuse me, um, is it okay if I hug you? And I said, please, please give me a hug. And she gave me such a hardly hug and really, I mean, a long hug. And this was, I told her later, this was one of the most important, valuable, appreciated hugs in my life because I was frozen. And she managed to really give me this feeling, okay, you're still alive and we are here for you and we find a way and we go together. And um, so not everybody wants to be hugged, but I like it. But I think asking is, is, uh, is a good way to do. So during all my period in the last three years were really ups and downs with very, very difficult time, long hospital times with oxygen uh, masks for weeks and everything. So it was tough times but I appreciated every single word and every single minute that nurses spend with me because, because it just helps not to be alone and to be with someone who is really um, patient and experienced. So continuing the way, I mean, if, if you talk about palliative care and I think we shouldn't talk about it on the only end at the end of life but much earlier so it's all about nursing nurses and uh, and experience um in germany we have a law that um from the time you have a metastatic disease you can have a palliative team care that comes to the house so um the nurses is coming the nurse is coming to my house whenever i have terrible side effects or something else and she's coming here she brings a lot of time and her experience and i really appreciate it and i wish this palliative care was not so negative um, perceived from patients but really see as a code as, as something that is protecting you you know from from uh, bad bad things so I, I think we have to do a lot uh, in, in palliative care. And I think that many of you probably work in palliative care as well. So I think this is a very important topic. And I think that nurses should get much more responsibilities um, because they have the experience and it might be different from country to, to country. But I often think that in, in many ways, in many um, points, they know much more than doctors. So why not to give them more responsibility? And of course, better um, reimbursement for their incredible work. So I think we have to do so much to, to really improve um, the, the um, status of, of nurses um, because they're, they're at least as valuable as the doctors. So I, I can't say enough how much I appreciate what uh, nurses meant to me and still mean to me because I still have a hard way in front of me. That's what I know. There's no easy way when dying from metastatic breast cancer. At least I haven't seen one. So I think there's still a long way to go. I hope a long way, but I know not such a hard way. And I will be happy to have nurses by my side. So I, I stop here. I could talk for hours, but uh, maybe I'm repeating myself. So um, I'm happy to answer your questions and there's no question I don't want to answer. So please feel free later in the discussion, whatever you, you, you're interested in, please, please ask. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ava. That was a really good um, overview and, and poignant, you know, really, really making the the point that it doesn't feel like a chronic disease at all and hopefully that we we'll, we'll get to the point when it, it does but i really um i really like the things that you were um saying about palliative care um certainly in the uk now we call palliative it's called symptom symptom management and palliative care because for the 
for the beginning parts of the trajectory, the palliative care team are helping you with the symptoms. And as you say, it's like a cloak to, to help you cope with the, uh, with, with the symptoms and with the disease. So thank you very much for that really, really good talk and, and help, helping to open out um, our talks today. Um, and we'll, what we'll do is we'll get people to ask questions after the three of you have spoken, if you don't mind. So you can have a, a little rest now while I introduce our next speaker. So our next speaker is Ingi Gultikin. And, and Ingi was born in Turkey in 1982, and she's the eldest of three sisters. She has a BA uh, in statistics uh, from a reputable uh, university in Turkey. And her career started as a data scientist 20 years ago. And she's got lots of experience in operations, in sales, in management. So she's really well-rounded uh, professional. And currently she works, and I can't really pronounce this, but it looks like Nielsen IQ as the Vice President for Americas and Europe Operations. Ingi is addicted to sport and arts. She sings, plays the piano and exercises heavily. And she, Ingi has um, BRCA2 mutation and she's, a, she says she's beaten cancer twice and has been cancer free for the last four years. During her treatment, she missed traveling and eating fruits without peeling them, but she's tried her hard to, to, learn, um, to learn styling scarves to calm her mum down. I, 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 know that, uh, I know that feeling uh, from my own experience, Inji, when I had... Uh, I had breast cancer, and it, it, I, my children did, wanted me to, uh, you know, they didn't want to see me without my hair. Um, Indy's never ceased to work, uh, dancing hard with her niece and smiling. So, Indy, can you tell us about your experience and tell us what made a difference to you in your care and also what? Is there anything that nurses could have known or would it would have been good if they had known? Over to you, Inji. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Teresa. Um, first of all, it's a, it's a privilege to be here on this platform. Um, let me start by giving a huge thank you to everybody uh, over here because of the because of the incredible work that you were doing actually. Uh, as it is tied to saving lives and it requires really big sacrifices, right? Um, so thank you very much for that. And thanks for giving me the opportunity. I always find uh, sharing our experiences super inspirational and uh, like a growth opportunity, right? We learn from each other. Uh, so thanks for the opportunity. Like you have mentioned, um, I mean, the first time I heard about there is something in your breast, uh, I think I was 17. I, uh, I was uh, 27. Um, I had my first breast operations at my 27. Um, then the second time I talked about the I talked about the breast is, uh, was with my father. Uh, it's a rare case, but my father had a breast cancer when I was 31st. And just a year later, when I was 32, I was diagnosed with uh, breast cancer, uh, which uh, required a total mastectomy due to the BRCA2 uh, mutation that not only me, but also my sister had. That was the total mastectomy I had uh, with, with an implant implemented to me. Uh, however, uh, I mean, a year later, I, am, I was diagnosed once again with breast cancer. Uh, this time, we, that required a kind of a total uh, axillary dissection. Uh, and on top of it, um, all the treatment procedures uh, that are known, right? Um, 
I mean, I'm calling myself a striver, by the way, not even a survivor, because I think we are achieving it, right? So that requires a wording better than survivor, I would say. Um, and uh, like you have mentioned, uh, it's been four, four years that I'm cancer-free, even four and a half. Uh, it's like, I mean, uh, I have my last six months to finish my fifth year. Everybody knows like what the fifth year after a cancer treatment means, right? Um, but the thing is, um, like Eva mentioned, uh, to, to have a mutation, uh, either BRCE1 or 2, no worries, it's a roller coaster as well. Um, it never ends. I mean, uh, in a regular or in, a, in, a, in an initial cancer um, uh, diagnosis, what you, what you are facing is after the fifth year, you go for a you go for checks in each and every year, but if you if you do have a mutation, you don't you don't have the chance to go for each and every year of the check. You need to be there uh, in each and every six months uh, for your um, for your ovarians, even sometimes in each and every three months, because all your uh, parts of body uh, you know that uh, under risk because of the mutation that you have, especially ovarians. Um, even, I mean, I'm going to say bye-bye to them like a couple of years later. So the story didn't, I mean, the story is not yet to an end. Um, still, I'm really super happy to uh, reach to the fifth year cancer-free. Uh, but this doesn't mean that this finishes and this came to an end, right? So, I mean, I still need way to go to finalize me, my 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 journey let me say or even if it uh, even i mean with the mutation it will never get finalized so i always need to find that courage uh that um that patience to to uh to live the life that i'm uh that i'm looking for that or that i feel like i deserve i mean to be happy let me say um Um, about the experience that I have, um, let me first of all tell that I agree with Eva. So I, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, I don't have that long of a journey like she has, uh, but I do have that series of a journey uh, as well. Uh, but um, I agree with what she is saying. Uh, I. I think I was extremely lucky with the nurses who took care of me during my treatment and who, with whom I am in touch still with. Um, but uh, with the experience that I had uh, through these last four or five years, uh, I think I can tell you four bullet points that made me feel really extremely lucky uh, during this period. Uh, the number one priority for me was about the accessibility, right? So I think this is for all the patients. Um, because as patients, we're running through something that we have no idea about, right? Um, and um, dealing with a kind of a hurricane, if I may call like that, right? Um, and need to know over here uh, how to navigate if everything is okay, if to have a headache is okay, right? So if the act or the pain that I have on my port is okay, right? So those seems to be simple, but really frightening questions, right? Um, the moment you face them, uh, you, get, uh, you get vaccinations or you get injections and then they have side effects and you just need to talk to somebody and that somebody is not obviously the doctor, right? So you're not able to call your doctor and ask like, uh, ask a question about your port or your, your, um, your headache. It's mainly the nurse, it's nurse himself or herself. Um, Again, saying, I mean, in that sense, I was really lucky that uh, the nurse, the nurses, one of the nurses especially, that were taking care of me were, was like super accessible through mobile, through WhatsApp. And whatever the question I dropped, I was getting a response like in a couple of hours. Uh, that seems to be something like a, 
I'm not looking for a, for sure we're not looking for a kind of a call center type of a thing. It's not that, I mean, we should be asking childish questions and uh, make the nurses busy, okay? But for the questions that really make sense or that really can change the mood of the patient, we really need super, we really need accessibility and that plays a big role in, in, in the total treatment, I would say. The second piece is about the um, about the uh, the knowledgeability. I mean, it's not about the knowledge on the nursing practice itself. It's about the knowledge about me myself. Okay, so what makes a difference is to talk with a person that knows what is with you. What is your what is your diagnosis? At which stage you are? Uh, are you hormone positive or negative? Do you have axillary dissection? I mean, can you can she use your right and left hand? So those things. I mean, what I was expecting and what I have faced um, was, um, I mean, a nurse who are aware of my, I mean, nurses who are aware of my situation. That gives you a total confidence, right? So that you don't repeat yourself over and over and over each and every time, because there is a psychological element on that, that I mean, the moment you start to say like, you're not able to use my right hand, I mean, this much of limbs are taken out of my body, so on and so forth. The moment you start to replicate your, I mean, repeat your st uh, story is the moment that you have um, that psychological, negative psychological impact once again. The third one is about the determination of the nurse, which is driven by the experience, I guess, right? So the moment we as patients, we see the hesitation in the eyes or hesitation in the speech is the moment that we that we start to feel the fear, which is not a feeling that we need or that we want during the total treatment, I would say, right? Um, and the last one is for sure the kindness and the empathy about uh, kindness and the empathy of the nurse, right? Because I know they're not doing a an easy job, right? So I don't want to seem like a spoiled girl asking really, I mean, unrealistically anything and everything. But um, when you do have the illness and when you are passing through the treatment itself, your mood, your psychology is up and down and up and down and up and down. And even I myself was not able to like think on like, how am I going to, how am I going to manage myself, right? So it's hard, I, I think, for a human being to be within all these cancer patient environment, to be uh, exposed to that much of a negativity or negative stories or negative mood, so on and so forth. But, I mean, if that is the decision for a person to be a cancer nurse, right, I think they should, I mean, those nurses should be aware of the fact that empathy is... Uh, empathy and kindness drives uh, the mood of the the mood of the uh, patient himself or herself. And again, saying I think I was really super lucky on that that I had really great uh, nurses that took care of me. But all in all, these four headlines or buckets, let me say, are driving the general. Uh, mood of the patient, the general experience of the patient, and eventually the tendency of the treatment, I would say. So, thank you very much. I hope I didn't talk uh, so much. Thank you, Inji. That, that was great. No, you didn't talk too much. You talked to, to exactly the right time. That was fantastic. Okay. So, uh, so thank you. And, and thank you for your experience and for your comments. Um, I, I think you're right. Being accessible and being there, just, just as Eva said, actually being there and answering the questions, the day-to-day -day questions make such a difference. 
So thank you for that. And again, I'll leave the questions until we've all, all spoken. So the next person that I want to uh, introduce is, <clears throat> is Aishan. Um, Aishan is 52 years old and she's married with one child and she works as a banker. And she was first diagnosed with breast cancer in 2015. And then in 2019, she was diagnosed with metastatic treat, uh, breast cancer and is having treatment and her treatment is ongoing at the moment. So, so Aishan, can I ask you to put on your camera? It may take a couple of minutes to just get to used to this. A line is good. Uh, I mean, if... Uh, yeah, are you okay? Thanks. Good. So Aishan, if, if you can tell us your experience and tell us what things nurses have done that have helped, but also if there's anything that you wished that they knew, they knew or that they knew at the beginning or that they know now. So I'll put my camera off and, and let you talk and tell us your experience. Thank you. Mm. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2015. Uh, at that time, of course, it was uh, very, very difficult for me. But when I look at those times today, um, I think uh, that were not the uh, uh, most difficult times because um, diagnosing with advanced breast cancer is means um, uh, much more than only breast cancer. Um, Patients with advanced breast cancer are going through very difficult times and they have so many questions. Um, when um, they have time to go to uh, that, um, all those questions are um, the first thing is the accessibility. Um, I, uh, Inji uh, uh, said the same thing. Uh, I have to say I was very lucky um, uh, during uh, my doctor visits because always there was a nurse accompanying the doctor, same nurse. So, um, um it, it, she she knew the uh, she knew my file and she was helping the doctor remembering the file and she was always accessible after uh, after the visit um i have i i was able to ask all my questions through whatsapp and she was um, answering whenever she's available it wasn't only me, of course. Uh, it was especially for advanced breast cancer patients. I believe the nurses are the most important bridges between the doctors and... Um, of course, uh, the nurse may decide to answer the question or uh, she can say, um, this question must be answered by the doctor. But having the nurse accessible uh, makes the patient um, uh, really, um, how can I say, uh, not comfortable, but not only comfortable, but also um, calm. Um, as the cancer gets more advanced, like metastatic breast cancer, um, it becomes a multidisciplinary. 
and uh, it always involves more doctors. In this case, uh, your file becomes more complicated, more complex. Um, it is not your oncology doctor, but in general involves uh, other disciplines uh, as well. And your tests, blood tests, or your periodical tests involves the other disciplines. In this case, having a center, um, I mean, having a, um, uh, for example, the oncology nurse as a center, having problems with other multidiscipline um, subjects, and if problems would be great. I want to give you an example. I was in the hospital uh, for two weeks recently and I got in a bacteria. It is not related with uh, my breast cancer, but I have to get the treatment together with my chemotherapy. So the uh, problem was, for example, if the bacteria was in my port, my port was infected with the bacteria and it is not possible in chemotherapy, but infectious infection doctor asked for specific tests from po my port regularly. So every time when I taking a blood, they were they had to take certain things from a certain uh, blood from my port uh, to check for uh, this infection. Um, however, my port was not working. So in order to check this. Uh, I didn't know what to do, and uh, of course the nurses taking blood, they didn't know what to do, but the oncology nurse, as I mentioned, being a center, just contacted with the doctor and their nurse, and because sometimes these as soon as possible, uh, you don't have time to wait. So, um, they um, recommended another solution and we continued with that. Um, so having uh, someone uh, who is solving these kind of problems makes patient's life much easier because we're already having uh, very difficult times. Mm. Um, since advanced breast cancer patient file is getting more and more complex every time, getting a new treatment, new medicine, and uh, so many tests, um, following up is very difficult for everybody, I believe, even for patient it's, uh, himself or herself. Uh, however, knowing what is going on in patient's life, um, knowing the file, maybe not in very detail, but in general, which medicines are taking, which chemo, when, is it, you know, once in three weeks, once a week, you know, those kind of details would be very helpful because sometimes um, if doctor uh, is uh, looking for some information, the nurse is there to fill the blanks. So um, I believe it would be very important uh, for the nurse to know the file of the patients, especially in advanced breast cancer uh, cases. Um, I was very lucky in my experience. Um, I had really great nurses helped me going through these difficult times. Um, I hope uh, everybody is as lucky as me. So I would like to thank you all for helping us 
we appreciate a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much much Aishen and we've had quite a few comments from people saying thank you so much to all our three patients for sharing their experience. I think sometimes nurses don't actually get to hear the day-to-day -day experience of, of living with either a BRCA mutation or, or advanced breast cancer and, and it is so important that we do hear it because we will never learn and we will never know what's important unless we do. Um, so we've got some time now for some, some questions and answers before I um, introduce Amanda. And so would you like to put your cameras back on, um, Inji and Eva? And I'll just see if we've had any questions. But certainly, what um, certainly what I got from your your um, presentations was the importance the importance of the nurse being available and and being able to answer questions that that you posed, whether she knew the answer or not. So you know, it's okay to say I don't know about that. I'll ask the doctor or or whatever, but it certainly seemed as if that was important to all three of you. Yeah? Do join in and put your, your mics on so we can have a conversation. I'll just see if there's any specific questions. Let me just have a look. I think I think that's true. The availability, the accessibility is, uh, I think, in all three of our, uh, three of us, in all our speeches, we, we mentioned about it. To have an answer to our question, either they know or they don't know, that's important, which is, I think, we can classify under the accessibility. But what is more important is the feeling of that confidence on top, right? So I think um, both Eva and Aishan mentioned about it, uh, saying like, we, we really need to feel that determination or need to feel that the nurse is not hesitant about the answer that she or he is giving, okay? Because the feeling of that care or that confidence is really super important when you are taking the treatment because you're dealing with your life, right? So yeah. you just want to make sure the answer that you get or the solution that you are served is the right solution. I think yeah. sometimes it can also be valuable to <clears throat> find the right solution together. Because sometimes there's not there's not black or white or not the right and the wrong way, but especially now that in, in, in the metat metastatic disease that there is no end of treatment. There's just um, um, you concentrate on quality of life, but of course also um, um, duration of life. We can you know many people say it's only about quality of life. It's not. I want to stay there because I still want to see. Him. Uh, my kids, uh, you know, starting their life as young adults now. So, um, but then, then sometimes we have to find a way always between um, efficacy and and quality of life. Yeah. And this is, there's no right way. It's always negotiations and, uh, and in, in the best case, I have both a good quality of life and efficacy, but sometimes it's it's not so easy, and then I really need someone to to find the right way and to discuss and and to say, look, we have this option and this option and this option, and you know, these discussions are very important. And in in that in this case, it's important also that the nurse knows who I am because if, if it's someone who sees me the first time, so they don't know my you know way of thinking and yeah. so this um we what we call shared decision making that is uh, usually used this term for treatment decisions i think it's also very important for all those decisions about how do i want to continue my life yeah. right yeah. yeah so that's a really important point eva um certainly when um, when i've been working with uh, people with um 
uh, advanced melanoma, one of the things that, that we would say to people in those first um, days of treatment and, 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 you know, while they're having a new treatment is to keep a diary because then you can see you, together what, what the symptoms are like, what the side effects are like and how you're living with those side effects. And as you say, Ava, sometimes just readjusting the timing of, of drugs or trying something else. You know, I remember one person had lots of diarrhea and we said, okay, so you could try some yogurt, you could try this, you could try having the drugs at night so that it's not going to disturb your day while you're trying to go to work. And, and it's it's that sort of thing, Eva, I think, because you're saying, um, working the solution out together. And we've had a, we've had a question about the, the, the coordinator uh, role that you were you, that you were talking about, um, uh, Aishen, um, where it, it says that um, when there are so many professionals involved, do you think a contact nurse or your, I mean, we, we call them the, um, the name nurse, who knows your file is the best person to coordinate and help those others work as a team for you? Um, what, what are your thoughts around that? Do you do you have um, contact nurses in your own um, countries, or or is that is that who you send to see the same nurse all the time anyway? Um, in our in my case, um, most probably Inji has the uh, similar experience. Uh, in my case, um, uh, I have a um, oncology doctor and oncology nurse. So, you know, we have been visiting the hospital very frequently, <laughs> you know, sometimes every week, every month. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm visiting lately very frequently. Anyway, uh, so, um, of course, your doctor and your um, uh, nurse, uh, they know your file. As it gets more complicated in involving the other uh, disciplines, um, in general, the doctor steps back, uh, putting the other disciplines doctor in front, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is understandable because it is their profession. However, in some cases, uh, as just I explained with my port, um, when you have a problem, you need to contact with somebody, but then with every discipline, you need to know their nurse, their, you know, um, I don't know, medical uh, team, it is very difficult. So, um, uh, in my case, our oncology nurse was helping to find the way. Yeah. It doesn't mean that answering all the questions, no, because uh, she's not going to be able to. However, she knows who to answer the question, yeah. which is great. Or, uh, in this case, when you need to reach the doctor immediately, uh, as a patient, you cannot reach the doctor immediately in general, then the nurse can help uh, yeah. uh, uh, finding the doctor, asking the right question. Yeah. And taking, uh, and, uh, according to the answer, taking uh, uh, action. Yeah. So the coordinator role, um, in this case, belongs to oncology nurse. However, as as I said, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that answering all the questions. No. no. Yeah. However, no, uh, showing the showing the way. Yeah. Yeah. Because you know better than us that hospitals are very complicated. Yeah. Uh, finding the yeah, right and you cannot know the right person always, right? So it's very exactly. hard to reach out to the right doctor, right yeah. nurse, or right department uh, at the moment of yeah. that crisis or that pain that you are having, right? Yeah. Maybe definitely. the doctor who is taking care of you is not available right at right yeah. that time. You know, maybe in the operation, maybe yeah. uh, the, on holiday. So. Yeah, um, it, it's in. Uh, we it, need to, I mean, having a coordinator role is very important for yeah. advanced breast cancer, in my view. Yeah, it's it's funny. In some countries, they call the we call it the um, we call it the um, the CNS, uh, the um, clinical nurse specialist. But in some countries, that that uh, the oncology nurse is called um, 
the nurse navigator. So oh. it's it's obviously, you know, it's a role that's a really important role for nurses to to take on. So so the thing that struck me with all three of you as well was where you were talking about the tricks and tips and and nurses knowing the the side effects, how they affect you day to day. Um, and and I suppose it is about somebody knowing you and 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 knowing your file. Um, that was quite interesting what you were saying, Aishan, about when the file gets bigger and bigger and more and more complicated. It's good to have somebody um, who, who has an overview of the file. Um, but I think, as you say, communication is really important. And 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 one of the things that, that you were saying as well is about nurses giving you the confidence and helping you to ask the questions that, that you need to ask. Um, and, and certainly that, that's a way that, that, that nurses can really help, I think, um, when people are living with advanced disease. It's about, you know, what's important to you and, and, and what are the questions you need to know today um, and about, you know, keeping a, a little notepad of questions for yourself so that when you go, you can make sure that the ones you want to, uh, you want answered, get answered first in case there isn't time for the other questions. I think that's something that's really important is about ha having the, the agenda, if you like, focused on yourself or focused on what you think is important as opposed to, you know, what the what the uh, system thinks is important, um, and I'm just looking at the other things that you were the saying that was a that, that made a, a difference to you, and and that was uh, about being present for bad news, and it's really um, it's really uh, important for us to hear you say that I, I think because sometimes nurses if nurses are in a consultation with a doctor and they're not they're not um doing anything particular they sometimes wonder if they should be there and i think when when bad news is broken or you've got a diagnosis it's really important for nurses to be there and to have time um either side of that appointment to spend time with you and to spend and to give you the time that you need after you've had that bad news. And, and certainly what, what we always do is to, to look at the list of outpatients and if there are people that have got um, um, results or they've got or they've got a diagnosis, to make sure that the nurse hasn't got to be in the next appointment to make sure that she can spend time with you outside the appointment in a way. I'm just trying to look to see if there are any other things that are, are really um, poignant for us to put into our, uh, into our curriculum. Kindness and empathy, and of course, you can't particularly teach that, though, um, you know, all nurses should be taught, to, should have skills, um, teaching in their training but but I think kindness and empathy is really important for nurses to 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 have and to demonstrate you know to to want to hear your story and to want to hear what it's like for you. We often discuss whether you can learn empathy or not. I believe you cannot really maybe up to a certain point but um, I, I think this is something you you have or you learned as a child or you don't have. But I don't know. It's a it's an ongoing discussion. But yeah, Eva, I'll tell you a secret. That was the subject of my PhD. <laughs> so my doctoral studies, I uh, I did an ethnography, which is um, which is where you um, work alongside a team. Uh, and it was exploring empathy from the point of view of um, the healthcare professionals and the patients to find out, you know, what it was, what was the, what, what difference did empathy make? 
So, so that's quite interesting that that's you come up with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, taking me back to those old days of empathy. But I think it is important. It's important to hear someone's experience and to and to imagine what it is like for them, what their day is like. Okay, so um, we're coming up to the time where I need to introduce Amanda. Is there anything else that you think is important for us to take on board? Hello, my name is Dr. Amanda Drury. I'm an assistant professor of nursing from University College Dublin, and I'd like to thank the European Oncology Nursing Society for the invitation to present today on our ongoing project related to advanced breast cancer nursing education in Europe. This project is funded by uh, the Pfizer Quality of Care Improvement in Metastatic Breast Cancer Patients and I also have non-financial conflicts of interest as a board member of the European Oncology Nursing Society and co-chair of the EONS Research Working Group. I'd also like to acknowledge my collaborators on this project, uh, Professor Teresa Wiseman, Dr. Gukum Basavan, Dr. Maura Dowling, Celia Diaz de los Rios, Shema Erdem, Violetta Royo, Dr. Gregorius Cotranulis, Dr. Amanda Shrewbridge, Dr. Wendy McAnally, and Naveta Nohavova. So to start off with a uh, background on this project, so breast cancer is a significant public health issue, as you'll all know. It represents one of the most commonly diagnosed cancers worldwide and accounts for approximately 2.2 million new cancers worldwide each year. Between 5 and 10% of people who are diagnosed with breast cancer are initially diagnosed with advanced breast cancer. And up to one third of people who are diagnosed with early breast cancer may recur with metastatic breast cancer at a later point. However, as a result of improving treatment modalities, the median survival of people who are diagnosed with advanced breast cancer is improving, with an almost two-fold increase in the five-year relative survival rate for de novo metastatic breast cancer, increasing from 18% to 36% between 1992 and 2012. People who are living with advanced breast cancer experience significant symptom burden and report low levels of quality of life. As many as one third of people who are diagnosed with advanced breast cancer experience poorly controlled pain, fatigue and anxiety. And unfortunately, there's no association between the time since diagnosis of advanced breast cancer and the level of symptom burden that the person experiences. So this means that uncontrolled symptoms may be a problem that a person experiences throughout the course of disease from the time of diagnosis, and this is, may potentially worsen with disease progression. In addition to high symptom burden, several studies suggest that people who are living with advanced breast cancer have a high level of unmet need. So as many as 69% of people who are living with advanced breast cancer express a need for greater information and more timely information regarding the status of their disease. As many as two thirds of people report greater need for information to support self-care activities and engage in self-management support. And as many, more than half wish to have greater access to information about cancer care. Several studies highlight an overwhelming preference among people living with advanced breast cancer to have access to a single healthcare professional who can coordinate their care and provide information and support related to their cancer, treatment and follow-up care. Despite the need for specialist breast cancer care to address the complex needs of people living with advanced breast cancer, Fewer than one third of people who are living with advanced breast cancer receive care from a specialist nurse. The 2020 European Breast Cancer Coalition survey suggested that just 55% of 34 European countries actually have specialist breast cancer units and where they exist, they're often poorly distributed throughout each country, 
creating geographical barriers to access even in countries where they exist. A further finding of this survey was that there are variable standards in the accreditation of these centres. So the, where there's countries exist that have specialist breast cancer units in place, these have multidisciplinary teams, but many do often not include a specialist cancer nurse. So the inclusion of specialist and advanced breast cancer nursing roles in multidisciplinary teams is often influenced by the variability in access to specialist cancer nursing education programmes and role recognition throughout Europe. And these are significant barriers which have been identified in several studies by the European Oncology Nursing Society in the last few years and it is an ongoing barrier which E.ON seeks to resolve. So in response to these critical gaps in nursing education and the provision of care for people who are living with advanced breast cancer, the European Oncology and Nursing Society have recently launched a study to develop, deliver and evaluate a fit for practice, comprehensive, inclusive and scalable online education programme, which will teach nurses specialist knowledge and skills in advanced breast cancer. The first phase of this study is a scoping review, which we are currently finalising the analysis of and preparing for publication. So the specific aims of this review are firstly to synthesise nursing education standards and competencies related to advanced breast cancer. Secondly, to evaluate the content of advanced breast cancer education programmes for nurses. Thirdly, to ascertain the modes of programme delivery and assessment utilised in existing advanced breast cancer education programmes for nurses. And finally, to evaluate the outcomes of existing advanced breast cancer education programmes for nurses. During this review, we have included studies which focus on uh, cancer education programmes for nurses, uh, which include content on metastatic breast cancer, designed for registered nurses or multidisciplinary healthcare professional groups, including nurses or programmes which are delivered by cancer nursing educators on the topic of advanced breast cancer. So the programmes that are included in this review must focus on postgraduate or continuing professional development programmes, providing ed education on breast, metastatic breast cancer as a primary topic or as a subcomponent of a breast cancer education programme. From these studies, we wish to understand the key learning outcomes, competencies, modes of programme delivery and outcomes of educational programmes, which are based on Kirkpatrick's four levels of evaluation, which are reaction, learning, behaviour and results. So examples of reaction outcomes include students' experience, satisfaction and self-assessment of learning in metastatic breast cancer. Examples of learning outcomes include the assessment, grades and demonstration of skills in skills-based assessment. Examples of behavioural learning outcomes are the self-reported and observer-reported application of learning in clinical practice and impact on the metastatic breast cancer service development. And examples of result outcomes are number of programme applicants, successful participants or graduates, alumni, employment and promotional opportunities uh, for people who have engaged in the program. So the review included any primary empirical studies involving quantitative, qualitative or mixed method studies and systematic reviews which evaluated the implementation and outcome of educational programmes about metastatic breast cancer. We also included peer-reviewed narrative reports that describe the development of advanced breast cancer education programmes and any standards or guidelines for breast cancer and metastatic breast cancer education programmes. We developed a comprehensive search strategy based on the PEOS inclusion criteria to identify relevant peer-reviewed and grey literature. So we started out by searching Medline, Sinhal, Scopus, PsycInfo and Web of Science databases using keywords breast cancer, metastatic breast cancer, nursing education and nurse training programmes. Searches were not restricted by language, but only studies that were published in English were selected for inclusion. We also undertook a grey literature search using the same search terms and inclusion and exclusion criteria. So we excluded any studies that were not published in the English language uh, due to the absence of translation funding to facilitate translation. 
We consulted the websites of key organisations in the field of breast cancer nursing, surgical oncology, medical oncology, radiation oncology, and we were sought to identify seminal grey literature for inclusion in the review, including guidelines for competences and education and training programmes in the fields of breast and metastatic breast cancer. We used EndNote X9 to manage our citations for multiple searches to remove duplicates uh, using the automated function and then manually double checked to ensure that all duplicates were removed. We subsequently imported our references to Covidence for screening and we screened studies of interest using sequential evaluations of title and abstracts against the POS inclusion criteria in Covidence. Full texts of our articles were retained following the title and abstract screening and at each stage of the screening process citations were screened by two researchers and any conflicts were resolved by a third reviewer. So our search yielded 918 citations, of which nine were peer-reviewed articles and two were grey literature reports. Peer-reviewed articles reported breast or metastatic breast educational programmes, which were conducted in Australia, the United States, Japan and Spain, and both grey literature reports were derived from the United Kingdom. So peer-reviewed articles were published between 2005 and 2019, of which four were published since 2015. So looking at the characteristics of the studies that were included in this review, and we found included documents were focusing on three of them on the development of education programmes related to advanced breast cancer or breast cancer. Five studies focused on the evaluation of such education programmes and we identified four documents which described educational standards and competences for nurses in the area of breast cancer or advanced breast cancer. Six of the 11 included papers described the programme development process. So programme development was informed by guidance from an expert curriculum advisory panel. That was four studies. Two studies used literature review to guide the development of their programme topic guide and curriculum. One study described using a review of competency standards and existing educational programmes. Two studies described using a qualitative consultation process, including Delphi consensus. And three of the six studies used multiple methods from this list to inform the development of their programme. So looking first at the synthesis of nursing education standards and competencies related to advanced breast cancer, which, as I said, included four uh, documents which we identified during our search. So of these uh, standards, two studies focused on the primary topic of metastatic breast cancer and the two remaining standards documents focused on breast cancer specifically and included recommendations related to metastatic breast cancer education and training. These documents made broad recommendations for nursing education related to metastatic breast cancer and recommended the inclusion of content relating to the background and significance of metastatic breast cancer, metastatic breast cancer treatment, supportive palliative and end of life care for metastatic breast cancer, practical skills for nurses caring for people living with metastatic breast cancer, including education, sorry, including education communication, cultural awareness and empathy and advocacy skills for people living with advanced breast cancer. Two of the four studies recommended the inclusion of content related to the development of nursing leadership skills and two studies included the recommendation for specialist breast cancer nursing self-care guidance. So seven of the studies described the development or evaluation of six educational programmes related to metastatic breast cancer or breast cancer. So this slide outlines um, which what the focus of each of these types of programmes were. So two of the six programmes focused on metastatic breast cancer. Two of the programmes focused on breast cancer, but included components on metastatic breast cancer, and two education and training programmes were designed to enhance the provision of supportive care to people with advanced cancer, including metastatic breast cancer. When we look at these six programmes in the context of the recommendations for educational standards and competencies for metastatic breast cancer, 
what we found was that few programs consistently aligned with these recommendations. So for example, three of the six reviewed programs included content on the background and significance of metastatic breast cancer. Three programs included content regarding the treatment of metastatic breast cancer. Four of the six described content focusing on various aspects of supportive, palliative and end of life care. And three included content related to communication skills, cultural awareness, emotional awareness and advocacy skills. Just one study provided guidance on multidisciplinary approaches to care and two provided education on self-care for cancer nurses. None of the programmes described curriculum related to clinical nursing leadership in the area of advanced breast cancer. When we look at recommendations regarding the methods of programme delivery and assessment, we found that only one of the standards documents made a recommendation and that was for face to face delivery of education programmes in the area of advanced breast cancer. When we look at the mode of delivery that were used by the six education programmes included in this study, four included face to face workshops, one included an online web webinar and one provided education via a workbook. Of the five uh, papers which described the evaluation of breast cancer education programmes, three used pre and post programme evaluation methods, two of which used quasi experimental methods and one study audited the end of programme assessment results for a component of their cohort uh, who undertook the programme. The studies that conducted uh, pre-post evaluations of these educational programmes included samples of between 31 and 156 participants. So the evaluations of the five uh, programmes that uh, evaluated the content, of the pro evaluated the outcomes of these programmes, considered all four of the Kirkpatrick levels of evaluation, but none of these programmes included an evaluation of all four levels. So two studies evaluated students' reaction to the educational programme, including self-reported satisfaction with the programme and the accessibility of programme content. Three of these five studies evaluated students' perceptions of their knowledge. One study reported the academic outcomes of a cohort of the assessment for one of the three cohorts of students described in the study sample. So it was an MCQ questionnaire that they reported the results of. Three studies evaluated students' self-perceived changes in their behaviour, including their levels of confidence in providing care to patients, providing information and education to patients, and onward referral of patients to community support services. And finally, four studies reported the results of their programme, including the number of programme applicants and the number of successful graduates. So the key findings from this study are summarised on this slide. Uh, so the review highlights several key limitations in the development, implementation and evaluation of education programmes for people living with advanced breast cancer, so for nurses. So firstly, there are very few educational programmes which provide nursing education in the area of advanced breast cancer specifically. In the few programmes that do exist, they are further limited by the use of face-to-face -face models of delivery, which feeds into the geographical inequities in access to education for cancer nurses. In studies that have been published, there is limited description of the content which is included in these educational programmes related to advanced breast cancer, particularly where programmes have a wider focus on breast cancer. Regarding the development of educational programmes, few programmes describe the philosophy or model of curriculum development and few align with the recommendations of competencies and educational standards for advanced breast cancer education. Furthermore, Patient and public involvement in education of healthcare professionals is increasingly being recognised as good practice, sensitising educators and healthcare professionals to the specific needs of people who are living with cancer. In each of the included documents, none in indicated the involvement of people living with or after advanced breast cancer in the development or delivery of ed the educational programme. And finally, the evaluation of educational programmes included in this review relied on very small samples and the outcomes of evaluation relied predominantly on participants self reported experience, their changes in attitudes, their self reported knowledge, skills and behaviours. 
to our knowledge, only one study included an objective evaluation of students' learning outcomes, and there are limited evaluations of organisational and systemic impacts of advanced breast cancer education programmes for nurses, including the impacts on service delivery, patient outcomes and patient experiences. So the next step for the ABC for Nurses initiative is to initiate a Delphi study in which people with advanced breast cancer, their caregivers, their family members will be consulted on their views regarding the core content of education programmes in advanced breast cancer for nurses. We will also recruit clinical, academic and advocacy professionals to share their views to inform the development of the EON's ABC for Nurses Education programme. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. No, it's just a comment saying thank you very much for a very interesting report. Important issues were raised. OK, so um, uh, Eva, uh, Inji and uh, Aishan, do you want to put your cameras on? Yes. We'll just see if we've got any more um, questions. Thank you for an impression. Or if you've got any questions for Amanda or Amanda for you. I think if I can make a comment that I'm embarrassed that this was pre-recorded because I think following on from your stories, I think you have already shared the information we need to know. And I think, you know, so much of this review, it's just showcasing that the literature is finding the same thing, but why are we still having the same problems? <laughs> But I still think this uh, research is important because, um, I mean, it's always about, uh, it's everything about the question of reimbursement. And we all know that time is precious. So if we really want to nurses to have time with us, so the system has to pay for nurses to have the time spending with us or to come even to the house or whatever. So, and, and, and we all know when we go to our payers and politicians and tell them, oh, it's important for us, they go like, yeah, yeah, uh, cute little patient. So we always need scientific papers. We need numbers, we need statistics. We need, you know, this official stuff. So I'm really happy that there's so much research going on because in the end we, we have to build a team that you build the research basis that, you know, and we add our personal experience and only together we can improve the situation for all of us. So I think it's always hand in hand and it doesn't help if we run around telling our story, but, you know, without really having a, a basis, a scientific, that this is not a personal story, but this is something that applies to many or most of patients. So I'm, I'm really happy about what you showed and that there's so much research going on and, uh, and very valuable. So thanks a lot. Yeah. And, and I, I suppose the next part of this, um, once we've done the Delphi study, uh, Ava, our, our aim for the, the main project is to develop online uh, learning for nurses throughout Europe. So you know, there are pockets uh, in, in Europe where there aren't any uh, cancer nurses, let alone breast cancer nurses, let alone advanced breast cancer nurses. So um, our aim is to get the information and the evidence we need in order to put together that um, online, online programme. And I suppose in a way it's now for me, we don't have any more questions. I'm just gonna check that. Yep, we don't have any more questions. So it is it is up to me to summarise, really. I, I just want to really thank Eva, uh, Inji and Aisham for sharing their experience. Sometimes it's not easy to do. It's, it's hard to go back and talk about times that are hard. But it, we learn so much from you when you are able to do that. And we really thank you for your precious time and for taking part in the symposium. And what we've heard from you is a number of things that have, have given concrete in a way to, to what the literature is telling us, but it is about the importance of communication, 
the importance of the nurse being present at bad news or diagnosis, about being accessible and being there for you to answer questions every day. Also to have knowledge of you, to know you as a person, to know your likes and dislikes, but also to know your, your case and be able to advocate for you for, um, and work out treatments with you. And it's important that we hear that this gives you confidence and helps you with the ups and downs and the roller coaster of, of having advanced breast cancer. But that kindness and empathy and being a care coordinator is so important for you and, and us knowing your file and being able to, to give advice but work things out with you so that together we can make a solution for, for your, your living well with advanced breast cancer. So we've just got three minutes left. So I'll ask about your, your, last, um, your last comments. I'll, I'll go around each of you to see if you'd like to say one last thing, but I'd just like to say thank you so much. And I've learned so much from your experiences. It's, um, it's made, meant a great deal to me. So, um, Eva, would you like to start to just give us your last comment? I also want to thank everybody, the organizers, the sponsors, and and also um, Esmo for choosing this um, this topic. I mean, um, I'm really happy that more and more patients are being heard, that the patient voice is more important. And especially in those conferences um, where it's very scientific and very, you know, statistic and everything. So I'm happy that you include the patient voice. I want to thank you for that. And, and to all the nurses out there, thank you for the great and hard, hard job you're doing every single day. I admire you and um, I don't know what we do, would do without you. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, you, you, without knowing you, you must be wonderful women and men maybe as well. Thank you so much. Okay. And in, Inja, do you want to say something last? Yeah, surely. I mean, um, just one thing, Teresa, before I conclude, uh, I saw a note, a, a question about the uh, knowledgeability of people around the BRCA2 mutation. Uh, just a parenthesis on that, uh, it's not about BRCA2, I think uh, the problem is around the, uh, or the watch out can be around the uh, gene mutation in general, right? Uh, because that's a special case, right? So you don't need, you, you not only worry about yourself, but you start to worry about your entire family and the generation that will follow your generation, right? So my mm. niece, my children, if I will have, so that's a super complicated situation that you have. And even if for the people that are not diagnosed within your family with a cancer, right? So they need to be they need to be navigated through the right path to get the right uh, to get to get the right support because the gene mutation is not taking you to breast cancer only. It's like each and every part of your body has certain level of risk, which is higher than the normal people, right? And I'm not so sure if people are really so much knowledgeable on that. So that was the question. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean. I was lucky that I was together with my uh, doctors and having second opinion with reputable uh, worldwide uh, universities in US as well. But, um, uh, and my cousin is a genetic uh, engineer, so she, he, he helped a lot, but everybody doesn't have that access, okay? And the management of that uh, psychological and um, physical think that you need to pass through. I'm not so sure if the nurse, nurses have that kind of a, uh, access <clears throat> on the knowledge or the vision, okay? Because that's really super hard what they are managing already. Uh, having gene mutation on top, like on their shoulder, I'm not so sure if that's the right way, but I don't think everybody has that exposure to the knowledge on that. Having said that, my last words will be thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I'm a rare case in Turkey. I'm not so sure if I'm really rare in the world, but I'm a rare case in Turkey. I'm uh, in literatures in universities together with my family. That's what I don't know. And it's really a great pleasure to uh, be a part of such kind of a symposium and share my experience or what I do feel. And a big... Uh, 
thank to a big thanks to everybody from the bottom of my heart uh, because you make us be present here uh, and live and smile right so thank you very much for all your sacrifices okay thank you and uh, we've actually run out of time now and uh, asian are you there no, I think Asian's gone off now. So, um, so I just want to thank everybody. We've just run out of time, but it's been a fantastic symposium and that's down to the, the participants. It's been a great honor to chair it. And thank you again to Eli, Lily and Novartis for sponsoring this symposium. Thank you, bye.